Hello, everyone. David here. Welcome back to the DGR podcast. I hope you are all doing very, very well. I'm going to do a solo podcast today. This is episode number 43. We are coming into the last quarter of the year. If you talk in quarters, I've learned to talk in quarters a little bit recently with a a business hat on. So we are coming into the 1st of October in the next couple of days, depending on when you're listening to this, or maybe not, if you're listening to this sometime in the future. Um, So last last few months of 2022, which sounds a bit weird, but things to be done. If you're making plans on 2023 and making some moves in 2023 then now is the time I recommend starting working on that we've me and Kira sat down yesterday to talk about our plans for the rest of the year so the last quarter of the year and then for the first kind of quarter of 2023 so um, I might talk about some of those plans I might not but that's what I would recommend doing now over the next couple of days is, is thinking about that because January, obviously, if you're a coach or a therapist or whatever, January is obviously an important time for a lot of people in the industry. And um, now is the time to be thinking quite intensely about that, I would say. In the last episode, I spoke about progress, procrastination, how it's a disease for me. So I'm fighting with every ounce of my being against that as much as I can and Kira is helping with that so uh, I'm going to do I'm going to answer some questions today I'm going to talk about we'll see I have a few Um, I'm going to talk about swing phase of gait so someone asked what I look at in the swing phase of gait it's going to be a tricky question to answer some some not too bad parts and then some parts that might require video but for the most part I think we'll be able to cover some good stuff um talk about elbow co-contractions for a better handoff Uh, I'll answer a question about that Uh, swing phase and then there's one around tibial internal rotation um, for patellofemoral issues how important is it and kind of pronation and stuff like that is it the most is it one of the most important things so we'll see I might not get to them all because I suspect the swing phase could take up a decent bit of this podcast um but but yeah we'll see so what else oh yeah we ran our uh we hit our 50k followers on instagram last week so that was a that was a cool thing i think for 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 us i'm just having a look now we're actually at 51.1k now and i actually went back because i said to kira i think we kind of announced, though, when we hit 40K followers, I think we had announced we've just hit 40K followers. And I said, I felt I feel like that was ages ago. So I went back and had a look and it was six months ago. So it took us six months to move from 40K to 50K, which for some people, like you might say, Jesus, 10,000 followers in six months. That's crazy. Um, I would have said that in the past, but actually that felt like slow enough growth for us um this time just where we're at now so i think i think i probably had a period where i kind of took my eye off the ball a little bit on the social media side of things not that i stopped posting or anything like that but i start i stopped trying to push it i stopped i got a bit lazy maybe with the content and also that was a period where we really pushed on the membership site and um and that was successful so we've added like i think we've added like five or around 500 members this year to the membership site so like that has been successful and that that was a bit of my a bit of my focus or a large part of my focus but I don't think the social media stuff needed to take a back seat at the same time now that I think about it the, on the other side that was when Instagram really kind of pushed the reels thing I think I really pushed the reels thing over the last six or nine months probably but definitely over the last six months and probably it was I was probably a little bit confused around what we were doing over the over the last while our content never goes viral as such like I will some posts will get 100 shares 50 shares where people share it on their story 50 100 shares but yet regardless it seems like no matter what we do it always just reaches between 20 and 50,000 people that type of thing um where some person might have a post that is not I, I don't think it's great I don't know if any people are sharing it because it's not like it's it's not like it's it's 
it's not like it's something that should be shared necessarily, but Instagram maybe shows it to a million followers and they, they get 20,000 followers overnight type of thing. So that that's, that's not me complaining or anything. That's just me saying this, this is the way our Instagram has gone. Our growth has gone over the last few years and it will, as far as I can see, it will continue to go like that. So we just need to keep pumping out quality content whenever we can but it shouldn't take us six months to get 10,000 new followers. And like the interesting thing is when I look at, so a week, it took us a week to get 1100 followers since we got to 50 K, then we got to 51.1 K, which I'm looking at right now. So it took us one week to get 1100 followers and it took us six months to get um, 10,000 followers. So that doesn't, really add up so i'm going to see how long it takes us to get from 50k to 60k i think we could get there in maybe half that time like in three months two two months or three or three months if we do a good job with our content so that's my idea there to get to 60k not like we don't also it's not a bad thing that we're not picking up twenty thousand followers overnight or anything like that because our followers are like good followers they're engaged uh, for for the large part and stuff like that so yeah, we'll see how quickly I can get to 60k followers. That's kind of a reminder for myself to do that. And we have like, I do notice when our followers grow quicker, we make more sales. And that's, that is, that is, there is a strong correlation there between getting more followers and making more sales. Now it's important that to remember that like, we're not, we're not buying followers. We're not trying to get, we're not trying to just promote, put up click, super clickbaity posts to get followers because I don't think that would correlate with sales necessarily. But I think the way we're doing it and putting out quality content, those followers that are then attracted to us does seem to correlate with sales. So um, I've said it before, like we have sold, um, I think, well, I haven't checked now in a while, but like, let's say lower body basics, I think I sold about 10,000 copies, probably, probably a bit more now. And we have 50,000 followers. So like, that's a large percentage of our followers will have bought at least one program from, from us, whereas accounts, maybe 1 million or 2 million followers, they, their percentage of, of sales to followers is, uh, is a lot less. Now, naturally it's going to be less because they have so much more, but I just think that shows that the quality of content that we give out does does correlate with sales, does correlate with followers who are engaged and interested in what we're doing. And then it does seem to correlate with, okay, they buy one program and then they'll go on and buy more programs and then they'll come into the membership site when they're ready and all that stuff. So to have 700 members now in the membership site and to have 50,000 followers, like that is a good percentage of people who are saying of, of them followers who are saying, I want to learn from you every week and every month. So, um, so yeah, I'm really happy with that. And all of that is just to say it took us six months to get from 40 K to 50 K. Let's see how quickly we can get to 50 K to from 50 K to 60 K without, without trying to kill ourselves or anything, just with the same strategy, but, but just maybe doing things a little bit better. So, um, so if, if that's you, if you have 1,000 followers, 2,000, 5,000, 10,000, it'd be just interesting to look at how quickly you're growing. Has that sped up or has that slowed down? And does that also speed up? And does that correlate with more business, basically? Which is, if we're being honest about Instagram, like the net, uh, the networking stuff, all those different things are important, really important. But at the end of the day, if you're running a business, you're running a business to make sales and actually you're not running a business to make sales you're running a business to um to make a profit so that's what we're trying to do we're trying to help a lot of people along the way but at the same time we have a business that needs is there and and um needs to needs to make a profit so that's my little I suppose instagram segment there now um okay let's talk about swing phase of gate so is there things you look at in in the swing phase of gate Oh no, is there simple things, simple slash obvious things you look at in the swing phase of gate? Um, okay, so we'll try and I'll try and we will try and break this down together if we can. Um, and again, talking about movement, listening to someone talking about movement is not as easy as listening to someone and seeing the movement in front of you. So bear with me while I try and go on a roundabout way of trying to explain my thoughts here. 
in our in our workshop i break down i have a slide where i break down just a very simple like swing versus stance and it's 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 way too it's way too oversimplified but i think it's helpful to frame the conversation and then once we go past that slide we actually i actually don't really talk about swing phase that much at all not because i don't think it's valuable not because i don't think we should train it or pay attention to it just because i think understanding when you to understand gait understanding the stance phase is more important initially for our coaches and therapists because you could get lost in the weeds in the swing phase i think and end up not helping anyone and the reason I'm saying that is you can break down like early, middle and kind of late stance into very, very, you can break them down, clearly break them down, and then you can design easy exercises to help people, right? So, for example, in your plyometrics, or sorry, in your training and in like, let's say a workshop, for example, we're going to go through, okay, here's how we restore our hip, knee, foot mobility, pelvis, all of that stuff. Okay. So we're going to restore mobility. That's a big rock, especially like if someone has lot is missing range of motion, we're going to restore range of motion. We're going to restore relative motion. Um, all, all of those things, it's really important. Then we're also going to, at the same time, or maybe slightly after that, we're going to get people to be stronger and we're going to teach them the skill of how to transition through the gait cycle and also, sorry, transition through the stance phase, I should say, and also how to pressurize and push through the floor. So that's really important. These are coordinative aspects that improve very quickly in terms of transitioning through the gait cycle, also how to push through the floor. That, come, that comes very quickly to people and then building strength on top of that takes a little bit more time. But at least the intermuscular coordination um, changes very, very quickly. And then we continue to build strength on top of that. Then we teach them plyometrics. So restoring range of, move, range of motion, strength, and then plyometric ability, in my mind, is absolutely vital. And 80, 90, 95% of your gains are going to come from that stuff for most people. Granted, if you work with Olympians and like high level athletes, then maybe you need to get more specific on whatever the one thing is that th it, their issue is. It could still fall into those categories of like plyometric ability, strength um, in a certain area or overall, or they're missing range of motion or mobility in a certain area as well. So for, even for a high level person, it could easily fall into one of those ca categories and it often does. But you might, they might need a technical cue in swing phase. You're not doing this in stance phase. You're not doing this. It, your arm is not doing this. You're too, you're too tall when you run. You're too squatted when you're run. You're switching, switching of the limbs is the timing is off all of these things. So don't get me wrong when I say I'm not, I'm not focusing massively on swing phase in the workshops. I'm not saying that swing phase isn't important. I'm saying these are like, this is the 95% of the results that you're going to get with 95% of the people is by doing these things. Also, I will kind of add on to that and say, when you restore strength in the areas that someone needed, um, movement, mobility in the hips or whatever, pelvis, the spine and plyometric ability, you will see people's gait clean up substantially. The swing phase will clean up. The stance phase will clean up. Everything will clean up when you restore movement in all of these areas because the gait cycle is embedded in us and things clean up when you just, when you just address the area that someone is, is limited or missing. Okay. You just address that and it seems to clean up quite quickly. So that, that's what I would say there. Then if I talk about swing phase in particular, there's a couple of things to look at. If you're looking at a side view, a couple of things that I look at that are, I think are quite easy to look at. If you're looking at a side view of, of someone running, let's l l just talk about like upright running for now. So max velocity are just up. Don't even see, think max velocity, just upright running. What you want to see 
if you think about like someone going into toe off and then that leg is it, that foot is coming off the floor and that let's say I'm let's say I'm I'm after striking on my right leg I'm coming into mid stance on my right leg I'm coming into toe off on my right leg and then my right leg is off the floor my right foot is off the floor and it's behind so the backside there what you want to see what you should be probably looking at an easy thing to look at on the backside is does the hip and knee flex together and that will pull the, the leg from the back to the front again okay so in backside mechanics there i think the biggest thing from the side view to look at is hip and knee flexion happening together i have a video on the member site that breaks this down and looks at that and looks at a uh, version two runners a version where this doesn't happen very clearly doesn't happen and one that very clearly does happen um it's called timing of flexions in sprinting if you're a member you should look at that and basically what you'll see in the guy that's not very good is his 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 he goes into toe off his he his toe comes his foot comes off the floor behind and his heel comes all the way up and kicks his butt kicks his glute while the foot is still while the leg is still behind him so be, he's not actually he doesn't actually get hip flexion to happen and knee flexion to pull that leg in front together he just gets a ton of knee flexion it's effectively like if you're on a pitch if you're on a uh, doing a warm up when you were young when you were young and someone told you to stretch your quad when you grab your you grab your foot and you pull your heel up to your butt he's running and he's in that position but the leg is still miles back behind him. So he has a ton of back extension. So that's a big thing I think to look at there is, can someone get hip flexion and knee flexion happening simultaneously? And if it doesn't, that will, that will throw off the whole gait cycle. So is that happening because the swing phase is a mess? Is that happening because the stance phase is, in a, is a mess? I don't think I, this is where I don't like to separate one versus the other because it's the same thing. The front leg requires the timing of the back leg. The back leg requires the timing of the front leg. Everything needs to be kind of roughly in the right position at the right time. And they all rely on each other. So I wouldn't just say the whole issue in his gait cycle is because he's flexing his knee a lot on his backside mechanics before he flexes his hip or they're not happening at the same time. I wouldn't just jump and presume that it could be an instance where this person is just in so much anterior pelvic tilt or orientation that he just gets so much back extension that his his body kind of has no choice but to do that. So this could be an example of, and in that video, you can see that that person is in that much back extension. So that could be an example of when I get his, his kind of ribs it, it, to internally rotate his pelvis to come under him a little bit, then he naturally strikes in a better position and he doesn't have all this backside huge like overextension of his back as he goes to push off and so he doesn't he doesn't have to just flex his knee he actually get his his pelvis is in a more neutral position i know neutral can be a dirty word but i don't think it should be in terms of sprinting and running posture so um his pelvis is in a more neutral position and then his hip flexors and adductors and stuff have a better length tension relationship to actually pull the hip forward um rather than just flexing the knee instead also if you have someone with knee issues like patellofemoral issues and this is how they run then Definitely, that is something you want to clean up, in my opinion, because otherwise they're kicking their butt with their foot back, be with their knee back behind them. They're getting a massive distal quad stretch on every single, um, on every single step, and there's a lot of tugging on that knee joint there. So that's something that I would definitely want to clean up. So first thing, not the first thing, but from a side view one of the big things to look at there is do knee does knee flexion and hip flexion happen together go and watch that video on DJ interactive timing of flexions and sprinting second thing would be still from a side view now that foot has kind of swung out in front um swing leg retraction is the other one so before the foot hits the floor you should see that foot coming back under the hip uh I, don't, I actually don't even like saying under the hip that much because if you take a screenshot of most of the best runners in the world, the foot doesn't strike directly under the hip. And then if you say under the hip, people will be like, oh, look, it's not under the hip. It's not directly under the hip. You're talking crap. It's 
I would say so that so look, that's fair enough, but I would say it's more it's coming back towards the hip. So what you're seeing is hip flexion, sorry, hip extension in the air before the foot strikes down. Okay. So that glute is pushing the hip forward or that foot is pulling back relative to the hip pushing forward before the foot hits the floor. So swing leg retraction and then uh, from the front side and then hip and knee flexion happening simultaneously from the backside those are two the two most important things are sorry not most important but easiest things to look at in swing phase i would say in the sagittal plane um when you look at from a front view and maybe the frontal plane and you start to see a little bit of transverse plane it gets a little bit more complex or complicated because if you look at someone coming out in the blocks of in an acceleration position, what you'll see is a ton of, a lot of the time, any of the best sprinters you look at them face on, you'll see a ton of hip adduction and internal rotation happening as they push out of the block on the, on the swing side. And I think, and I, this is where I don't want to lose people now, but I think that is because they have to generate motion. So they're, they're starting from more of a dead stop. So there's much more kind of, it looks much more uh, uh, messy is a word that some people could use, but like, I don't want it. Messy sounds like it's a bad thing coming out of the blocks. It's just that it's, it looks much tidier in upright running. What people, what a good runner is doing. Everything looks more organized, organized, whereas everything looks a bit messier coming out of the blocks. If from the front view, at least where there's a lot of rotations happening, there's a lot of kind of torque to generate that motion. It's not messy as in a bad thing. It's just for lack of a better term, there's, there, it, it looks more like there's kind of limbs flying everywhere, which is a prerequisite kind of to not flying everywhere, but there's just a lot more motion needs to be generated, let's say. So you'll see a lot, a lot of, you see a lot of flexion and adduction and maybe some internal rotation there as well. Now, not as much as it looks like it, it there's a lot happening at the femur, but the pelvis is probably rotating in the same direction. So Yes, they might get some kind of flexion, internal rotation and adduction. Um, and a lot of it is happening at the femur. And then uh, a lot of it could be happening at the hip as well. But the pelvis is probably rotating away from that leg as well. So it's not as much. Now, what I would say is why, why I think that is happening is because usually you could break down, you, you could kind of on a broad very broad now be broad when you think of this but you could think of stance as more extension internal rotation and an adduction and then swing as more flexion abduction and external rotation so that's a nice broad way of breaking down those two phases separate to each other but i'm going uh i'm going to end up losing people now but if you think of if you think of swing as more flexion external rotation and abduction it's just it's just relative to the stance phase and really what that means is you're seeing if you think of stance if you think of stance as more extension more adduction more internal rotation it's true the whole chain it's not just it's not just that one bone so like if you want to get more internal rotation uh, pronation at the foot the foot needs to be on the floor so it's going to be hard to get a uh, pronation you can't get a uh, you can get like an open chain pronation of the foot but it's actually not happening with any relative motion at the foot so hang on i'm gone i'm gone off on one there now but um so okay right so back to acceleration we're coming out of the blocks and you see this so this is like looking at swing phrase from the front now you see this, and then I'll talk about upright running as well. You see this more adducted, internally rotated um, position. Adducted, internally rotated, and, and it's kind of the hip is flexing, obviously. So this is because the hip lock, which now has, which is so important for the hip lock is happening on the stance leg, but that's so important to give room for the swing leg to, to come through. Okay, so <laughs> um, trying to organize my thoughts, how I explain this well. So I'm sorry. I know 
maybe I do this to you sometimes, but I try my, I try my best to make things as, as clean as possible. So in acceleration positions coming out of the blocks, the hip lock, which is the free side of the pelvis getting higher than the stance side. That gives room for the swing leg to come through. Okay. Otherwise your foot is going to kick the floor. So if, if in a, if I strike the floor, and my swing side of my pelvis come drops down a ton, then I'm probably that swing leg needs to come through. And I'm probably going to kick the floor or I'm going to have to externally rotate and abduct out a lot to clear the floor, or I'm going to internally rotate and adduct a lot to clear the floor. So if the swing side of the pelvis drops, when I'm running, I have to create like a lot more kind of rotation, adduction or abduction to clear the floor. Otherwise, I'm, my foot just kicks the floor. OK, which it, do, it, it, it doesn't happen with anyone's gait because the brain doesn't allow that to happen or pretty much anyone's gait unless there is some kind of neuro issue going on. The, the brain will find out a way to either adduct or abduct or like ER one segment of the limb. So in, when they're coming out of the blocks, because the hip lock, hip lock happens so much later in an acceleration position, it happens in that triple extended, that toe off position, then to get the knee to come through, which is happening earlier to the swing side to flex through earlier, what you'll see is a lot more adduction and internal rotation in an acceleration position, okay, of the swing leg. This is happening then also relative to the stance leg, which is in a lot more external rotation because in an acceleration position, you're much more up on the toe. So there's much more ER on the, in the, on the stance leg in an acceleration position. And then there's probably much more IR going to happen. Anyone can look at like a video of type in Usain Bolt or someone accelerating or an acceleration. Um, there's, Kind of Asafa Powell, I think, has a good one where you'll see him from behind and you'll probably see that swing leg coming through and turning in, but then the stance leg is externally rotating a lot. So it's not that it switches when we get up into upright running. It's just that these movements get much more subtle and much more organized looking. And then because the, the hip lock is happening earlier in upright running, then the stance side of the pelvis is higher. So... Uh, is higher earlier so that knee now has kind of time to come through a little bit more in a little bit more of a straight line okay so it's not none of these things are happening in straight lines there's rotations nothing happens in straight lines in fact there's rotations that are occurring but that leg is swinging is swinging through a good bit straighter than it would have been in an acceleration position because we have to, for two reasons, I think, because we have to create way more, generate way more motion in an acceleration position. So there's much more obvious rotations happening. That's reason number one. Reason number two in an acceleration position is there's much more external rotation on the stance leg because I'm already, it's, all, it's almost like I'm already on the toe. I'm pushing off. I'm landing on the toe and I'm kind of pushing off of the toe and the ball of the foot, which is more of an ER position. Um, that's, that's number two. And then there was a number three, but I can't remember it right now. And then in, and, uh, and the hip lock is happening. Yeah, number three, I suppose, which, pairs with that is the hip lock happens so much later in an acceleration position that it's happening in that like fully extended position for the stance leg um and and so to clear the floor i need much more i need much more room so i probably need much more rotation and it's not going to be in the acceleration position the swing leg is not going to externally rotate and abduct out so much because the stance leg is externally rotating and you're not going to see because it's already on the toe you're not going to see both legs kind of er like that because then the pelvis is it's basically when when if let's say i'm in i'm in the blocks and i'm going to push off my my right foot and my left leg is going to swing my left knee is going to swing forward my right foot is going to be my right whole right leg is going to want to ER a lot because I'm pushing off the toe there and the ball of the foot. So if I try and ER the, if I try and ER the left leg that's swinging through as well, then the pelvis isn't actually going to be able to rotate. And we already said that the rotation requires the, the, that type of movement requires a lot of rotation. So hopefully I'm kind of piecing the puzzle together a little bit now. So basically you don't want to see ER on both sides happening together because 
when both femurs turn out, that looks more like a squat, let's say. And, and in a squat, the pelvis is staying square. Whereas in my right leg, I'm pushing off that leg and the left knee is coming up. The right, right kind of femur is externally rotating and the left femur is going to be internally rotating. Both of those things are serving to turn the pelvis to the right in this instance. And then when the left foot strikes, the opposite is happening. Both of these things are serving to turn the pelvis to the left. Okay. So hopefully that's starting to make sense as to why there would be a lot more adduction and internal rotation coupled with the flexion of the swing leg in um, acceleration. And you're still going to see that in upright running. It's just that it doesn't need to be as much because in upright running, the hip lock happens earlier and there's actually room for that leg to swing straight through. Now, so that's, that's the, that's in an acceleration in the, in, from a front view where you can see kind of frontal plane and transverse plane movement in at, at what's happening at the swing leg. But again, as I just explained, hopefully they rely on each other. Now in upright running, I've explained, hopefully that the hip lock is going to happen and that's going to allow the, the leg to swing through um a straight or at least when you see someone from a front view who abducts and externally rotates out a lot that's a, that's going to be an issue and what they're trying to do there is clear the floor so what they probably don't have is much hip external rotation or internal rotation for that matter and it sounds funny that like someone would turn turn out into external rotation if they don't have much external rotation. It's just probably that the pelvis is locked in place and the only place they have space is to just turn everything out to the sides and then they can get their rotation from there. Their rotations can't happen from straight in front of them. So they can't get rotations. Like if I, I, I just have my hand in front of me here now and I can pronate and supinate my hand, internally rotate and externally rotate or just even think pronate and supinate. And I don't need to turn everything out to the side to do it. It can, it can kind of rotate on axis if you want to think about that. So that's happening in upright running a little bit more. Um, yeah, so what you will see sometimes is someone who abducts and externally rotates everything out to the side. I, when I say flexion, abduction, and external rotation, it's not that adduction and internal rotation aren't happening within that as well so that's kind of a, a conversation for another day but it's 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 that the no i'm I, i'm not going to go into it but it's not that those things aren't happening and it's the same on the stance phase there's flexion happening on the stance phase there's external rotation happening during stance phase it's just more internal rotation through the whole system because we need to push through the floor happening in stance and swing okay so let me gather my thoughts for a second here yeah so when someone has so there's a few things to look at in 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 swing then in upright running when someone is limited maybe in in range of motion at let's let's just say the hip what you what you might see is someone just turning everything out so they abduct and externally rotate out that looks not like not a nice gait if you look at someone from the back or from the front they do that on the swing leg it just looks like not so nice and i would say it's not particularly efficient they're not getting clean switching of the limbs because things have to kind of come out and around now there is some very fast people that do it so i'm not saying it's not it's not it couldn't be a successful strategy for people it's just it's just not one that I would try and train someone to do where they just have to swing their leg out and around rather than it coming kind of true in more of a straight line, even though that straight line still involves rotation. The other thing I would say is, um, and I have some pictures of a client that does this, is when someone has doesn't have access to hip motion, let's say, um, any external rotation, what they'll do is they'll find their external rotation from somewhere and often that comes from a knee. So I see this all the time now with recreational runners and joggers. Um, if you watch them running, they get a ton of knee external rotation when they run. And they're effectively what their body has figured out how to do is clear the floor by using a lot of knee external rotation. And that's making up for a, probably a lack of hip flexion and hip external rotation as well. So that's something to definitely watch out for. And that will 
obviously affect the swing phase as well then because they're actually landing in a ton of knee external rotation then. So the femur is maybe stuck in a bit of internal rotation and then they find their external rotation from further down the chain. And then a lot of, a lot of those people will end up with a, a foot that looks like it's over pronating a lot because when we go into a lot of tibial external rotation that can often couple with a lot of eversion at the foot for someone where it just kind of everything dumps into the inside this is where people try and block someone then they say okay you're you're pronating too much um and we need to block pronation altogether i would suggest that these people can't pronate their foot at all so what they've done is they they don't have an ability to get internal rotation through the system so hip internal rotation, knee internal rotation, femoral internal rotation, t- and tibial internal rotation coupled with pronation because these people are coupling eversion of the foot with a lot of tibial external rotation. So that is not internal rotation through the system and that is not a nice clean way to push through the floor either. So I would suggest that a lot of these people actually need to learn how to pronate their foot need to learn how to get tibial internal rotation, but need to not couple it with a ton of femoral internal rotation because they're probably there already. So what they might, what they actually might need to do is recover a little bit of their hip external rotation and then kind of, so expansion and then you, so you need to maybe teach them earlier phases of gait where there's more external rotation, more expansion. And then you need to layer on the internal rotation strategy on top of that, where you actually teach them, okay, this is how you get on top of your foot. This is how you push through the floor. This is how you get external rotation and internal rotation through the full system rather than the body trying to borrow it from elsewhere. So this is, seems to have turned into like a biomechanics heavy episode, but basically the swing phase there, it's really good to look at for um, like is the hip lock happening on the stance leg? And if it's not, then the swing phase is going to be messed up because they're going to have to do something funny. Are they going into a lot of abduction and external rotation to try and swing that leg through? Um, if they are, there's something funny probably happening. We need to clean that up. Is, is the swing phase just happening with a lot of knee external rotation? Um, if so, I would suggest, I would, I would, I would clean that up with people with pretty much everyone. You don't see too many of the best runners doing that, to be honest. Um, And then what else? Is there a lot of knee flexion before hip flexion in the backside mechanics? You need them to put those two things to happen together. And then uh, swing, swing leg retraction. So is that foot coming back? to the floor before the foot hits the floor or does it kind of continue to travel forward and away if it continues to travel forward and away that's just that there's a lot of braking forces to be to that are being applied so any good any good sprint coach in pretty much history would talk about that swing leg retraction they might not use those that term um but that's what they're effectively looking for there um that's a term that well i don't know actually that's a term that Franz Bosch uses that I've kind of learned from him, but that concept is not something that I learned from him or from, I learned, a, I learned a lot about it from him, but that's like a, a most common concept in, in, um in track and field circles, to be honest. So that's that hip extension in the air, that swing leg retraction. So that's all about the swing phase and hopefully it makes sense please let me know if you have questions on any of that. Um, do go and watch the video on DJR Interactive. That's why it's there. Like that podcast is great. I really enjoy the podcast. Gets true to people. It's a chance to go for a walk and listen. But like, if you want to actually learn this stuff, go and watch that and actually see what I'm talking about. I think that would be really important. So that's on DJR Interactive. Um, whether I will go into anything else, actually... I don't know. I might just leave it on the suit. That's the swing phase episode. I wonder how long that episode was. I don't actually know. Um, what else? Do you think restoring tibial internal rotation and getting the medial arch is the biggest thing for patellofemoral? You know what? I'm going to answer that next time. And then how would you go about improving elbow co-contractions for a better handoff in rugby? You know what? I think I'm going to answer that next time. No, uh, 
I'll answer that now. So how would you go about improving elbow co-contraction for a better handoff in rugby? So handoff in Ireland, we call something a handoff. So someone is running at me, I have the ball and I hit them in the chest with my hand and they go backwards or they fall on the floor. Um, in other sports, they might call it in American sports, like a stiff arm, which actually sounds, I actually really like the sound of it. Oh, oh he's stiff armed because he like, gave him a stiff arm in the chest and he fell backwards or whatever. So how would I go about doing that uh, about improving elbow co-contraction? So to, to hand someone off in rugby or in any sport, Gaelic football, hurling, um, soccer, it's prevalent, but not as prevalent. You're not allowed to maul people as much, very prevalent in rugby, very prevalent in, um, in um, probably AFL and very prevalent in, American football as well, and probably several other sports. So the elbow, you do need co-contractions around the elbow. So if I go to hand someone off and my elbow is going to flex or extend, then like that's not going to end well for my elbow or for me in particular, because I'm not going to hand them off. They're going to keep coming through that, that kind of flexion or that extension, particularly flexion. If my elbow extends in that position, then I'm probably going to break my elbow. If it, if it flexes, then they're just going to continue to come into my body and hit me. So you do need co-contractions, which is basically the forearm flexors and extensors, the biceps and the triceps, and then a lot of co-contractions around the shoulder and the wrist as well. Um, so all of those muscles, the hand, all of those things are going to, everything is going to be trying to isometrically contract or co-contract so I can push someone away from me. Um, and this might lead you to think that you need to work on like a lot of elbow co-contraction. So the skill of co getting a co-contraction around the elbow, I would suggest that in rehab, maybe you need to work on that if you have an elbow issue, but, um, or a shoulder issue for that matter, because if you can't do it well at the elbow or at the wrist, then your shoulder is going to end up with a lot of force and probably, uh, is going to be susceptible to injury if you can't actually dampen some of the forces that are coming in. They need to be dampened by the by the hand and the elbow and all the muscles on the way in. So that's what I would, and energy needs to be transferred. So that's what I would suggest there, um, that maybe in rehab you could work on that. But if you're just talking about improving your handoff in rugby and there, there hasn't been an elbow issue, then I wouldn't pay attention to the elbow particularly at least not in maybe the co-contraction type of way, I would just go and get stronger. So actually, yeah, I'll talk about this first. So like bicep curls, tricep work, uh, forearm work, um, and bench press. That's what I would do. If you see the best rugby players in the world, I can promise you that you look at the New Zealand players, the England players, the Irish players, the South African players, they're beasts. I can promise you they haven't thought about elbow co-contractions or are getting isometrics around the elbow. What they have done is get unbelievably strong at things like press-ups, bench press, um, shoulder press, all of these exercises, bicep curls, triceps, forearm work. And what they have done more importantly or as importantly is get very good at rugby because a handoff or a stiff arm requires you to be in an in a position and have the cognitive skills the perception to be able to understand where your body is in space where your opponent's body is in space and then put yourself into an advantageous position where they're almost kind of reaching or lunging towards you a little bit and you can you are in a position a strong position to where just a stiff arm like that can put them on the floor now some some people in rugby, like, don't get, I'm not talking about where someone is just an absolute beast and they run at you and they grab you and they actually just throw you on the floor, which is evident in rugby as well. But I'm talking about like where it's more of a just one quick stiff arm in the chest and down they go. So that's what I'm talking about. That I would say the vast majority of that skill requires is a skill that requires on you being in the right position and having the right timing, which is built off of playing the sport and also having uh, evasion skills, uh, very good perception and 
agility as well. I think agility is a massive part of that because usually it comes when I've kind of sidestepped so one player and I'm I'm making a little bit of a break and a guy is coming from the side of me and I'm able to just at the right time I'm able to hit him. So you can be as strong as you want, but if your timing is off, then that's not going to work particularly well. So my answer there is agility, perception, and bench press, shoulder press, biceps and triceps, and don't worry about the elbow. That is what I would say. Get strong and get better at the sport. And that goes for, that's, that's a lot of answers. Um, that's, that's my answer for a lot of things to be honest. Um, just don't get, just don't let the strength work slow you down. That's the, that's the one issue I would say there. So, but that's again for another day. So I think that's the end of the podcast. I'm going to, again, talking about kind of the last quarter of the year we're going to we've written the we've written down our plan to release an achilles program before before the end of the year or actually probably in the next month or so so we've written out a plan working backwards from date we want to release it the kind of talking about the email sequence that we, we haven't written this but the email sequence coming up to that when we're going to try and film the exercises, when we're going to try and put the program together. Um, I'm writing the program now over the next few days, going to fully write that, uh, additional resources that need to be involved with that. So that's been our, that's our like one of our goals for the last quarter of the year is to get that released and then also have another program ready to release in January, which is going to be a good month for sales if we have something that's good to be available and that will drive sales of our other programs and our membership sites as well so that's our last quarter of the year um and i would suggest that you kind of spend five or ten minutes or half an hour today thinking about what your plan for the last quarter of the year is even if you don't sell programs or anything like that i can promise you there's something that you could think about working on and um what else are we going to do uh yeah. And then think about your first quarter. Like what is, is there something in January you want to do? It's a good opportunity for, for yourself or for people to work on things. So I don't want to, I'm not trying to sound like a guru here, but that's just basically what we're, what we're going to do. And then um, last thing is to just make sure you sign up for DJ interactive. We have that, that video you should watch as accompanying with this uh, podcast is timing of flexions in sprinting. Uh, that's in the sprinting chapter. Uh, this week I did a video on the hinge where I kind of analyzed the hinge movement with a client. So he took some videos of his hinge. It was part of a session that we were doing and uh, I was just talking him through his hinge and looking at how he was actually just over rotating with his hinge. And he was rotating through segments that I didn't want him to rotate to make up for a lack of rotation, maybe elsewhere. So that's one thing that I looked at with him. And then we looked at like adding, adding in load, why I might, why I added in like two dumbbells instead of one dumbbell for this particular client, other people I might add in one. Uh, so that's the video I did this week. Then last week, hang on, bear with me. Uh, so that's, that was the kickstand hinge over rotation and adding load in this fly of the wall, fly on the wall video. You can see David breaking down a client's kickstand hinge, how much rotation is optimal what would be considered over rotation and where it's being driven from and how to la add load to the movement. Uh, Chris has a live class on Wednesday. So Chris's classes are going down an absolute treat for all our new members. Um, last week, what to do when your client really struggles with to get expansion posteriorly. So it's a simple, a simple title, but David looks at a client who struggles with posterior expansion will help you see why this is occurring and give you a couple of strategies to help improve that. Uh, the week before actually was a similar, similar type of topic about restoring external rotation and doing a couple of breathing exercises with a, a client pre-session or pre, I don't want to say pre-session, but pre-strength session, let's say, because it's still part of the session. So those are the last kind of three videos or those are four videos that you could watch straight away that would significantly improve your understanding of movement and I think your understanding are your ability to to get results with clients as well so that's DJ Interactive you should you can open up the show notes or you can just type that into your phone and um, yeah let me know if you have any questions or any of that stuff and please let me know if that if that explanation actually helped on swing phase um, I would appreciate that because I have no idea this is like just me talking to myself so 
So yeah, hopefully it did. And um, hope everyone is good. And I will talk to you guys next week.